Once again, good evening. I am grateful that I have this opportunity to share together with you a little bit more of an understanding of what happened during the Protestant Reformation. A little bit of understanding to help us with our own spiritual life and the reflections that we have of why we are Christian today. You know, as we're considering what occurred during the time of the Reformation, I want us to understand a little bit of why it's not just sola scriptura, but more than this that made the Protestant Reformation. The text today is going to be talking about the role of faith in the Protestant Reformation. The understanding of what faith did to the early reformers. What does it mean to believe in faith alone. Now, Luther himself would be a little bit disappointed, as I mentioned last night, that 500 years later, we were still here waiting for the kingdom of the Lord. Luther himself had no intention of starting a church. At the time where we finished our study yesterday, Luther has no idea of starting another church. Luther is not trying to make a new church. Luther's aim is the reformation of the church, what he understands to be the church of God. He has no intention at this moment of actually starting some other church, some other body of Christ. And so when we consider the 95 Theses, what we need to do today is get from the point where he found the Bible, which is where we stopped yesterday, until he actually nails these theses to the door. That's what we're going to do today. And then the consequences of that is what we're going to finish off our seminar with tomorrow. So let's review just a little bit and also catch up some of you, which were not here with us yesterday, but thank you so much for being here today. When we looked yesterday, we found that the Bible itself was an unknown book at the time. It was very rare. Copies of it were rare, and Luther finds by accident a Bible in the library. Uh, what we're told is that this library was chained, the, sorry, that the book was chained to the wall. But the reality is that most books were back then, because books were expensive, books were hard to come by, and so something as valuable as a copy of the Bible would be chained to the to the library itself so that nobody could get away with it. When Luther finds this Bible, he understands for the first time that it is possible for him to have complete access to the Word of God. This is sola scriptura, where the Word of God begins to make changes in Luther's life those same changes that the Word of God can make in your life if you would actually read God's Word for yourself. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we learned that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, when we read this yesterday, it was important in the context of the Word, but for today, it's important in the context of the role of faith. That is why Luther said, that I am convinced by scripture and plain reason. I do not accept the authority of the popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. So Luther considers the Word of God, the Bible, to be his sole rule of faith. He himself said, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. A simple layman armed with scripture is to be believed above a pope or a cardinal without it. He's not saying that you should not believe the words of popes and cardinals. That's not what he's saying. A pope, a cardinal, speaking with the authority of God's word, 
should be what? Should be believed. Because the words are not theirs, those words are the Lord's. But if we neglect the word of God, then we neglect light. In Psalm 119, 130, it says that the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. And that is why the Apostle Paul said that he was not ashamed of the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so what we realized is that as we study the Protestant Reformation, we look, begin to understand the concept of salvation itself. And in John 17, 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So this is a summary of what we established yesterday. That the word of God was the basis of the Protestant Reformation. That without God's word, there would be no Reformation. That if Luther had not found that Bible, he never would have had the resources he needed in order to produce the Reformation that happened later. Now, after Luther produces the Bible, after he finds the Bible, we need to understand that Luther did not suddenly make a reform. In fact, when Luther finds the Bible, he's still studying at the university and makes a decision in 1505 after he finds that Bible, in 1505, Luther decides that the only way that he will be able to experience personal salvation is to become a monk. And so after finding the Bible, the Bible does not lead him away from the church. Where does the Bible lead him? The Bible leads him deeper into connection with the church. And in 1505, he makes a decision to become a monk, and he joins the Augustinian order. In 1507, he will be ordained as a priest in the Augustinian order. Now, he has a problem. And the problem is that he is preaching, but he doesn't believe. You see, Luther is deeply troubled by his own sinfulness. He has learned from the church that he's a sinner and that he must overcome sin. And as he's read God's word, now that he has access to it, he reads God's law. And when he looks at God's law, do you know what he discovers? <laughs> that he's really a sinner. So now, this man looking at the law of God, says, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Now, his direct superior in the Augustinian order tries to calm him down. He says, Luther, relax. Well, he doesn't use the word relax. I'm paraphrasing. But basically, he says, Luther, relax. You need to have faith in the saving power of Jesus Christ. The more he talks to Luther, the more Luther is concerned. He's concerned, Luther, I'm lost, I'm lost, I'm lost. But he's preaching to the people what he himself does not believe. By the way, have you ever heard the sermon? I mean, you're sitting in church, those of you who go to church, you're sitting in church and you hear a message from somebody who does not believe what they're preaching. You can tell. You can tell. Right? Or you're going to school and you're taking a class from somebody who should not be teaching that class. And you sit there and you're like, you can tell. This is Luther's problem. Luther is going through the motions. He's doing what a priest is supposed to do. But he doesn't actually have faith that his sins can be forgiven. And so he continues his studies. His superior has been named to be the chair of theology at the university in Wittenberg, north central Germany. And in 1508, he invites his former pupil to come to Wittenberg with the purpose of teaching theology to students. 
So now Luther becomes a teacher of Catholic theology. He's a teacher of theology. Here's the problem. Luther starts teaching the Bible to his students. That, I know, I know for you and me that's hard to understand. How could you teach theology without the Bible? But basically, theology was taught from catechism. It was not taught from scripture. Luther begins to teach doctrine, but from scripture, which from time to time contradicts that which the church has been teaching. He especially begins to fall in love with the book of Romans. So quoting from Luther, at this time, as he's teaching in the University of Wittenberg, good priest, teacher of theology, teacher of other priests, he says, I greatly loved to understand Paul to understand Paul's epistle to the Romans. And nothing stood in the way but that one expression, the righteousness of God. Night and day I pondered until I grasped the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy he justifies us by faith. Thereupon I felt myself reborn. Paul says, I started reading Romans and I loved it. And I started teaching my students about Romans and they loved it. The only problem, he says, that I had with Romans is that Romans leaves no place for my righteousness. Romans leaves no place for my works. Romans leaves no place for some good thing that I do to get salvation. In Romans, there is no way for Luther to discover that he should do good works in order to be saved. And so he comes across that text and it gives him that problem. He says, righteousness, the righteousness of God. When he began to understand this righteousness, then he says, I realize that I am saved purely by the grace of God. And it is the sheer mercy of God that I can experience even the slightest idea of what salvation is. So now he begins to teach this at the university. In the meantime, he rises through the ranks of the Augustinian order. And as he's rising through the ranks, he becomes a person who's in charge of a couple different monasteries. And he needs to go from monastery to monastery. So not just a teacher at the university, not just a professor. He also is responsible within his order. And so he has 11 monasteries that are assigned to him. He goes from monastery to monastery, watching out for the monks, making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And also, he has some responsibility to, as an administrator, to transmit funds that are being collected at the monasteries to their respective places. And in 1510, he is given the commission to take the dues that were supposed to be given to the Holy See in Rome to take them to Rome. It's about 1,400 kilometers, just short of 1,000 miles away, which he's going to walk, by the way, together with a companion. There's no planes, trains, no automobiles. He's going to walk this. Along the way, he'll avail himself of other monasteries where he will sleep, and he is the courier on his way to Rome. Luther is approaching heaven. For Luther, this is the experience that he has been waiting for, to go to the holy city, to meet holy men, to be surrounded by those at the center of the spiritual universe. 
in his mind, he sets himself up for really, really amazing things. You know, when you're public speaking, they tell us in public speaking that you should never, ever tell people that you're going to give a good presentation. You should never do that. Because you build up their expectations, and then once they listen to you, they go, not that good. Even if you were really good, they're like, not that good. So you never do that. But, but this is what Luther has done. Luther has built up in his mind that he is going to the heart, the center of spirituality. He's envisioning this heaven on earth where he will be surrounded by others who love the word of God as much as he does. And he can't wait to get there. And as he arrives before the city, he looks at it the way that, he, that they would look going, like going to Jerusalem at Passover. He's excited. He can't wait to get in to the city itself. Now, there is a little problem. And that is that when he gets into the city, he doesn't discover any of the things that he thought he was going to find there. He finds nobody discussing scripture. He finds nobody having great prayers and masses. In fact, he's discouraged. After the third day that he's there, he says maybe something is wrong. I need to do something myself, and because I am a sinner, I am not seeing what I need to see. And so he begins a pilgrimage to go and visit the relics of 80 popes that have died. And he believes that if he goes and he touches the relics of these 80 popes, that his spiritual discernment will be increased, and then he'll be able to see the beauty and glory. He finishes the pilgrimage. It gets worse. Not only does it get worse, but Luther <laughs> attends a mass. Now remember, Luther speaks Latin, right? Luther speaks Latin. The people don't. People don't speak Latin. The common person does not speak Latin. The last Romans were overthrown a thousand years before by the Ostrogoths. The language, the Italian that's being spoken there is not Latin. The people do not know what the priests are actually saying during Mass. Luther attends a Mass where during the Mass, the priests are telling jokes during Mass. He's shocked. He, he, can't, he can't believe this. The more time he spends there, the worse his spiritual life seems to be. He's not finding this. He does not blame the church. He blames himself. He says, I am I'm mixing with the wrong people. Something's wrong with me. I need to do something. And so he decides to engage in an act of contrition. And he goes to the Scala Sancta. The Scala Sancta are stairs that were said to have been brought to Rome miraculously from Jerusalem by St. Helena in the 4th century. They consisted of 28 white marble steps. Today they are encased in wood located next to a church which was built on ground which was supposedly brought from the Mount of Calvary itself. He's told that if he will climb this staircase on his knees, that he can receive an indulgence for somebody else. He has a grandfather who was not a particularly good man. And Luther, who loves his grandfather, doesn't want his grandfather to be burning in the fires of purgatory. And so Luther decides to climb the steps. 
The Catholic Church taught that by ascending these steps on your knees in an appropriate fashion, you can buy an indulgence for somebody in purgatory. If you ascended each step reciting our Father, Pater Noster, you could release a soul from purgatory. Luther wanted to free his grandfather, Lindemann Luther, from purgatory. And so he pays the money at the foot of the stairs. He pays the money, and he then climbs the stairs on his knees, saying the Our Father at each step. He understands that if he does this, he'll receive an indulgence. Now here, we can take a break for a moment from our historical study to explain and understand what an indulgence is. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia in the article on indulgences, because I don't want to say what I think indulgences are, but according to Roman Catholic teaching, what is an indulgence? According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, the Roman Catholic Church to this day claims that Jesus, Mary, and the saints did so many good works that they left behind merit that they didn't need. That treasury of merit is in possession of the church. And the Roman Catholic Church can then bestow this merit on others as it will. In other words, Mary, Jesus, the saints, they were better than they needed to be. And that extra goodness that they had is given to the church, and the church then has the authority to give this merit out to others to make up for their lack of merit. This is an indulgence. The indulgences, though, were not given. Generally, the indulgences were sold for money. This idea of an indulgence is not found in scripture. It does not exist. There is no indulgence anywhere in, in your Bible. You read it cover to cover, back and forth as many times as you want, you will not find it there. There's many things that we think of, but are not, are not in scripture. I'll give you an example of one thing that's not in scripture. For example, in scripture it says, that a man in Proverbs, it says that a man who finds a wife obtaineth a good thing and receives the favor of the Lord. It says that. That when you find a wife, you receive extra blessings from God. But you can read that Bible backwards and forwards, and there is no verse in the Bible, none, zero, that says the woman who finds a husband finds a good thing and obtains it doesn't exist. It's not there. It's not there. Apparently, we got the better end of this deal. There are many things, you know, we make the assumption, but it's not there. There are no indulgences in scripture. Don't, it, the, the concept itself does not exist. The idea that one person's merit could be passed to another person. This does not exist in scripture. So, Luther has the Bible. He's studying Romans. And now he's paid the money for the indulgence that he's going to give to his grandfather so that his grandfather can get out of the fires of purgatory and make it to heaven. As he's climbing the staircase, while Luther was climbing the stairs on his knees, he thought he heard a voice of thunder, which cried at the bottom of his heart, the just shall live by faith, which, by the way, is what he was teaching to his students. It's Romans chapter 1, verse 17. The just shall live by faith. He was said to rise up in amazement from the steps and began to feel personal horror and shame. He proclaimed out loud to the other people on the staircase, the just shall live by faith. He walked away. He didn't complete 
the task, realizing that this act could bring no salvation either to him or to anyone else. And so he stops this act of indulgence that he was engaged in. Now, he's in Rome for another two weeks. He stays just, just over two more weeks in the city. He has to finish the business that the order had sent him on. And upon conclusion, his idea of Rome changes. Now, I can, I can dance around this or I can read it to you, and it's better just read it to you, because you need to understand what Luther's mindset is when he leaves Rome. Remember how he came. He came because he was going to heaven. He was going to the New Jerusalem. He was going to the place of grandeur and amazement. What does he say when he left? The city which he had greeted as holy was a sink of iniquity. Its very priests were openly infidel and scoffed at the services they performed. The papal courtiers were men of the most shameless lives. He was accustomed to repeat the Italian proverb, if there is a hell, Rome is built on top of it. And then he himself wrote, what infamous actions are committed at Rome, one would require to see it and hear it in order to believe it. It is an ordinary saying that if there is a hell, Rome is built upon it. It is an abyss from whence all sins proceed. Rome, once the holiest city, was now the worst. Let me get out of this terrible dungeon. I took onions to Rome and brought back garlic. He went there with the full intention of receiving the blessings of what he perceived would be the center of spiritual life. The problem was that just prior to his arrival, the, the two popes before him, the papacy had been purchased by money. There were times when there were four popes at the same time, all claiming to have the same infallibility. <coughs> Luther realizes upon leaving Rome that the things that he had been told and the reality were not the same. Coincidentally, that staircase remains until today. And there are still Catholics today that pay the money at the base of the steps and climb them in the belief that they are receiving an indulgence. Even until today, even until 2017, this practice still does exist. Luther returns and decides that the only thing that he can do is continue the study of God's word. What did, the, what did God's word do for him? It changed his life. So he says, the best way for me to help others is to keep sharing with them the word of God. From that time, he says, also I beheld the precious sacred volume with new eyes. So when I left Rome, I took the Bible with new eyes. I went over all the Bible and collected a great number of passages which taught me what the work of God was. And as I had previously, with all my heart, hated the words justice of God, so from that time I began to esteem and love them as words most sweet and most consoling. In truth, these words were to me the true gate of paradise. He says, I lost confidence in those men, but I did not lose confidence in God's word. God's word remained to me. He was able to separate the man from the message. And he was able to say, there are corrupt men at the heart of the work. But the message, the truth, the word of God, it is true. I will continue to teach truth. And so he continued lecturing at the university. In 1516, a very special man is going to arrive in Germany. You see, Pope Leo has decided that he wants to rebuild St. Peter's. To rebuild St. Peter's, 
is going to take a lot of money. The best way to get money is indulgences. Really good way. And so Pope Leo is going to institute a new round of indulgences. He's going to add a whole list of new things that you can do in exchange for an indulgence. The caveat is that from this point on, half of all indulgence money collected everywhere must be sent to Rome for the rebuilding of St. Peter's. When you go to Rome today, when you go to the Vatican, that structure that you enter into was built with indulgence money. It was built with money from individuals who were told that giving money to the church would excuse their sins. So, with this in mind, arrives in Germany an expert in indulgence selling. His name is Johannes, or John in English, Tetzel. Tetzel is a seller of indulgences. He is famous for the expression, as soon as the gold in the casket rings, the rescued soul to heaven springs. That was his famous catchphrase. <coughs> and he was really good at it too. You know, in the 1700s, in North America, including here in Canada, but mostly in New England, they used to have these preachers, they were called firebrand preachers. They were generally Methodists, sometimes Baptists, but generally Methodists, and they would go around New England and they were famous as firebrand preachers. They would go into a place and they would convince everybody that they were sinners. Say, you're all gonna burn, you're all gonna burn, you're burning, you're burning already. They got the name, firebrand preachers. Well, Tetzel is ahead of his time. Tetzel is a firebrand preacher. There's a lot of superstition at this time. There's not reason. The majority of people are not educated. The majority of people cannot read. And here comes a man and he says, Grandma is roasting in the fire of purgatory. Don't you love your grandma? Don't you remember the beautiful things that she did for you, that she made for you? Don't you want to free her from purgatory? Now, by the way, what Tetzel was saying, was that actually the teaching of the church? Was it the teaching of the church? No. No, 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 no. Tetzel is going above and beyond He's got, that's not the teaching of the church on indulgences. We just went over that a few minutes ago. What Tetzel is doing is he's adding his own extra flair to the teaching of indulgences. Why does the church look the other way? Why doesn't the church correct Tetzel? Why don't they stop Tetzel? Why? Because it's rolling in. It is rolling in. Of all the indulgent sellers, nobody's as good as, te as, as Tetzel. I mean, once you use the grandma card, I mean, you got him right there. Free grandma from purgatory, and she made that special porridge, you know, the one where she added the raisins in it, because that's all we eat in Middle Europe at that time, but she did, oh, grandma. And the moment I give the money, the, 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 the moment that I put it in there, Grandma, boom, right to heaven. I guess send grandma to heaven. Now he's doing good until he arrives in Saxony. And he arrives in Luther's territory and he begins his preaching and his sermons and he starts. And word gets to Luther about what this guy is doing. So Luther says, I gotta go see this. I gotta go check this out. So Luther goes and listens to one of Tetzel's sermons. This is, this is not the teaching of the church. This is not the teaching of scripture. This is wrong. And so he tells the people in his sermon, don't do it. All of a sudden, Tetzel's figures begin to drop. 
the amount of money that he's sending back begins to drop. So Tetzel's angry. Tetzel goes to the local magistrate. He says, you need to stop this man. I've been sent by the Pope himself to collect these indulgences. This man, what he's saying is stopping the work of the Holy Father. You need to stop him. So Luther is asked to give an account to the magistrate. He explains to the magistrate that this is not the teaching of the church. The magistrate agrees with Luther. Ooh, Tetzel is angry. So he writes to Luther's superior. And again, you know that expression, if you want, you follow the money? You know that expression, follow the money? Guess what? Luther's direct superior just happens to be in a lot of debt. He's been spending a lot of money. And he's using Tetzel's indulgence money to pay off his debts. So when Tetzel comes and says, hey, the money's going down and it's Luther's fault, Luther's superior gets involved and says, you need to stop. We need the money. So Luther replies. Luther's reply is what we call the 95 Theses. They're not against the church. Most people today who are studying Protestantism seem to think that they're 95 Theses against the church. They're not. They're 95 Theses against the doctrine of indulgences. In fact, within the 95 Theses, Luther appeals to the Pope to make the necessary corrections to the church. Because at the time that the Theses themselves are placed there, he still believes that the Reformation can happen within the church. He sees no need or necessity for another church at this time. He simply believes that there will be a Reformation within that church, that the church will return to a biblical basis and put away this doctrine and idea of indulgences. The theses themselves are written to promote discussion. They're a formal academic <laughs> disputation. Luther writes them to engage in debate. He wants people to be talking about this. And so he posts them. Now, whether they were actually posted on October 31st, they might have actually been posted a little earlier, a little later, but we do know that he sent them to his superior on October 31st. So when he sends officially this document, says, look, these are the things that we should be talking about. Here's 95 points that we should be having conversations about. He has no break with the church at this time. And in fact, he is asking the Pope to make the corrections within the church. Did the church ever make those corrections? It didn't. In fact, indulgences are still official teaching of the church. Right here in North America, if you're a Roman Catholic, you can get the Manual of Indulgences. Last edition was printed in 2006. A new edition is about to be released. You can receive a manual of indulgences as a Roman Catholic with things that you can do in order to receive forgiveness of sins. The book's actually quite lengthy, contains all kinds of different things that you can do for forgiveness of sins. The difficulty here is that any teaching that is not from Scripture brings with it danger. Indulgences are not found in Scripture. Thus, they are the teaching of man. <clears throat> Can the Church of God teach man's theories? Should it be inventing things on its own? I want to read to you. Uh, it's written much better than I can say it, so I'm just going to read it. But basically giving this explanation, can the Church of God teach something other than what's written in the Word or something that's contrary to the Word of God? In the commission to his disciples, 
You know, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, go into all the world and teach the gospel to every creature. Christ not only outlined their work, the work of the disciples, but gave them their message. Teach the people, he said, to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. The disciples were to teach what Christ had taught, that which he had spoken, not only in person, but through all the prophets and teachers of the Old Testament is here included. Human teaching is shut out. There is no place for tradition, for man's theories and conclusions, or for church legislation. No laws ordained by ecclesiastical authority are included in the commission. None of these are Christ's servants to teach. The law and the prophets, with the record of his own words and deeds, are the treasure committed to the disciples to be given to the world. Christ's name is their watchword, their badge of distinction, their bond of union, the authority for their course of action, and the source of their success. Nothing that does not bear his superscription is to be recognized by his kingdom. If the kingdom of God is to be established, that kingdom can only be established upon the basis of God's word. It cannot be established on man. Why can it not be established on man? Because we're fudgeable. We change. We change with circumstances. We change with time. We change. God's word, God's word remains. That's what we studied yesterday. Anything that is based other than on God's word is going to be changeable. And thus the kingdom of God cannot be put on something that changes. Bible students, what's the parable to prove this? What's the parable that you cannot do things other than on a basis of the word of God? Parable of two men who are building houses, right? You're familiar with the parable? One man builds on a rock, the other man builds on sand. The one who builds on that which can change, his house will fall. And so it is essential for us, if we would be part of the kingdom of God, to be part of that kingdom which is based on that which does not change. That is why Luther said the Bible is alive. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. A simple layman armed with scripture is to be believed above a pope or a cardinal with it. For you and me, at this point in our study, we can understand the importance of scripture. But do we understand the concept that Luther now introduces? That there is no salvation by your works. You cannot earn an indulgence with the Lord. You cannot. There is nothing that you do to be part of the kingdom of God. To be part of the body of Christ is a gift that is given to those who accept Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says that faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We have God's word. When we have God's word, what will naturally result? The reading of God's word leads to faith. Your faith. What does your faith do? Let's go back. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For therein is revealed a righteousness, a righteousness of God from faith unto faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. It is your faith which saves you. Your faith and faith alone. Can I do something good for my salvation? Can I do something? Can I climb a staircase? Can I say a prayer 70 times in a row? Can I do something that will earn me salvation? Let's look in scripture. Romans 3.28. Remember, Luther is highly affected by Romans, yes? Romans 3.28. Therefore, we conclude, the Apostle Paul says, 
that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. How are we saved? How are we justified? We are justified by faith without the deeds of the law. These are not my words. This, uh, the great thing about being a Protestant preacher is that Protestant preachers, we read a lot of verses. Right? You, you know, it's like you came to a history presentation, I keep giving you Bible verses. Right? Protestant preachers, a lot of Bible verses. You know why we do that? Because when people argue, we're okay. Because they're not arguing with us. They're arguing with the word. The word is clear. We conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law is what the word of God tells us. There is nothing that I do. There is no good thing in myself that I do. How many of you know the song Rock of Ages? Okay. Rock of Ages, clap for me, right? If you know the song, right? Rock of Ages. In the song, you sing the correct doctrine, even though many of you don't actually believe it. But the correct doctrine is in the song, Rock of Ages. Augustus Toplady actually wrote it, is afraid of thunder, and got caught outside during a thunderstorm, was hiding in this little rock, kind of like a mini cave. And that's where he came up with the song, Rock of Ages. But in this song, it says, Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no longer know? These for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. There is nothing that I can do to make up for sin. Because the wages of sin is, is death. There's nothing that I can do that will make up for this. That's why... In reading the Gospel of John, how does John conclude the Gospel? In John chapter 20, verse 30. Now, the Gospel of John's interesting. The first three Gospels, they're called synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called synoptic. It's from a word that means like in order. So the first three Gospels, they talk about the life of Christ. But the Gospel of John, it covers only 17 days of Jesus' life. Only 17 days. From the three and a half years, the Gospel of John is only 17 days. And John says, look, I wrote them for a reason. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, in the Gospel of John. Verse 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. What is the only thing that's required for salvation? What is it? One thing. One. One thing. To believe that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. One. One principle. One catechism. One faith. The apostle says that we believe. To believe that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior is the one and only requirement of salvation. You can do nothing to make up for this. Some people will tell you that you can. And the Apostle Peter says, be careful of these people. First, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. They promise them liberty, while they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. Do not let anyone ever fool you into thinking that you can make up for sin. Okay, I need you to understand this. Before the cross of Christ, how did... I don't want time to get away from me here, but I got to do this, right? Before the cross of Christ, how did God illustrate to the people what sin was? There were sacrifices, right? Up until the cross of Christ, before the Lamb of God, there were lambs that they brought there. I want you to do the math. So this room is actually a, just slightly smaller than the curtain that existed in the sanctuary in the wilderness, okay? So what happens is this. Let me see if I can illustrate this in the best way, right? You sin. 
And now when you sin under the old covenant, you have to take a lamb. You have to find a perfect lamb, spotless, without blemishes. You find the lamb. You bring it to the tabernacle in the old covenant. Then you have to kill it yourself. The priest doesn't kill it. You have to kill it because you sin. You kill it. When you do so, your sin is transferred from you to the animal. The priest then catches some of the blood, right? Because without shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So the priest catches some of that blood, and he goes inside, and he sprinkles it on the curtain that's between the holy and the most holy place. So he takes his fingers, he puts them in that little dish that he caught the blood in, and he goes like this. Now, if you do the mallet, it's a little bit slightly viscous substance, it's about a thimbleful. I, most of you don't know what a thimble is. My parent, my mom's a seamstress, my, my dad's a tailor, so, uh, but you know what a thimble is, right? Thimble, okay? So, it's about a thimble of blood, okay? Now, let's do the math. Let's pretend that women don't sin. Just, just for the sake of calculation, women sin, okay? All have sinned, okay? But for the calculation, there's about 450,000 Hebrew men in the wilderness. Let's again, just for ease, just, just to make it easier, right? Let's say that men only sin once a year. We sin more than once a year, but let's just say we sin once a year, okay? So, do the math. Assuming that just men sinned and they only sinned once a year, how much blood is on the curtain? Do you know how often they clean the curtain? Once a year. Once a year, they clean the curtain. How much blood is on? That's 450,000 thimblefuls of blood. <coughs> there are no windows in the, in the tabernacle. And the door of the tabernacle is a series of curtains to prevent the exchange of oxygen. If there was not an altar of incense in there, you would die. You couldn't live in there. To God, sin is... Sin is real. Sin has weight. It has value. You can't just say some prayers and it goes away. To God, sin can be measured, quantified. We are not saved because of anything that we do. We are saved only by believing in faith in the grace of Jesus Christ. So I have a question. If the gospel is that simple, right? if it's so simple that all you have to do is believe in Jesus, why doesn't everybody do it? Why doesn't everybody do it? Because when you accept Christ, he changes you. Submission to Christ is submission to change. And fundamentally, we don't want to change. So we come to the Lord, and we say, Lord, I love you, and I believe in you. And the Lord says, wow, I'm so happy. Come with me. I'm going to change your life. I'm going to change how you dress. I'm going to change how you eat. I'm going to change how you live. I'm going to change the way you think. I'm going to change who your friends are. I'm going to change what you think is entertaining and fun. Oh, oh, oh. oh Lord, I love you, but I don't want to change. The gospel's simple. The problem isn't the gospel. The problem is that we don't want to allow the change that God offers. John Wesley said when he was learning about truth, he was an unbeliever, founder of Methodism. This is about a quarter before nine while he was at a meeting where they were reading Luther's introduction to Romans. He says, I was there and while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed I felt I did trust in Christ, in Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken my sins away, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. God loves you. 
God desires to change you so that you can be part of his kingdom. This is what God desires. It is that change and transformation of character that you resist when you think that you can do something yourself for salvation. This frustrates the Lord and the Lord's plans. We are justified by faith in his blood, Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Because, verse 10 says, when we were enemies, he still loved us. Today, you have the opportunity to receive the grace of Christ, to be transformed by Jesus Christ. This is essentially what the protest of 95 Theses did. It made the gospel of Christ free to each and every one of us. You need to pay nothing for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is his free gift of transformation to you. Today is the day of your salvation. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, I have heard thee in a time accepted. In the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I hope and I pray that you will accept the free gift that God wants to give you of his salvation and allow him to change your life. For those of you who are willing, I would like to do the same thing that I did last night. I would like to pray the way that they prayed in Luther's time. I'm going to kneel down. And I invite you, if you're willing, to kneel down together with me and ask for that grace of God to be given freely to each and every one of us. You don't need to, of course. You can stand or remain seated as you feel comfortable. But I'm going to kneel down and I'm going to ask for God's presence here today to be given to each and every one of us. I'm going to do that now for those who are willing. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful gift of grace which you've given to us through Jesus Christ. And we ask, Lord, that you would help each and every one of us to receive this gift and to be transformed by it. We ask, Lord, not simply for the forgiveness of sins. But we ask, Lord, for transformation of life, transformation of character, so that we can be witnesses of your character in this world so that others would be able to see the beauty and joy of a full relationship with your grace. We ask, Lord, that as we have this experience, that you will let us come in contact with others who are desperately in need, those who feel the weight of sin upon them, and use us, Lord, to lead them to the foot of the cross of Christ so that they too can experience the beauty and joy of grace. We ask this today, Lord, not because we're worthy, but because we ask it in Jesus' precious name, amen.